Hi everyone, this is Mrs. J, and today we're going to keep talking about the definite integral and we're going to learn about the fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, so I have a warm up for you guys, so please pause the video and give it a shot. All right, go ahead and check your work here. Um, for the first part, you're doing a Riemann sum with three subintervals and you're using the right endpoints. Um, so you're actually starting with this y value for your first height and then here and here. Now you'll notice here that the width of each of our rectangles is not uniform. Um, here, um, delta x is two, here delta x is three, and here delta x is one. Um, so you do need to calculate the individual um, area separately. Um, so just be careful with that. Um, so the total distance traveled is 15.2 feet. Um, for the next one, we're writing a Riemann sum um, of the area under the curve of this function, natural log of x plus 1. So first we can find a way to describe delta x. So it's always our um, upper limit minus our lower limit divided by n. Um, so you can see for each um, rectangle width, we're starting at 0 and we're adding some uh, multiple of 4 over n. So we could describe that with 4 over n i. When it's the first rectangle, it's 4 over n times 1. When it's the second rectangle, um, that x value is 4 over n times 2, so on and so forth. Um, so here's our general form. Here we can substitute um, the x value at any given interval. Um, so 4 over n i delta x is 4 over n. And then we'll just substitute this into our function. Um, remember for Riemann sum, we do also need to describe the interval um, of x because it's not um, apparent in the notation. And then for number 3, um, when it says calculate L sub 2, so that's a left Riemann sum with two subintervals, so two rectangles for this function. Um, so first, if we're splitting it up into two rectangles, you take your end, subtract the upper endpoint minus the lower endpoint, and then we'll divide it by two for the two rectangles. So um, each rectangle should be pi over two units if we're gonna have a uniform width. Um, so I made a little t-chart here, so zero pi over two and then pi. However, since we're doing a left Riemann sum, we're just going to use these two um, y values for our heights. Um, so the width of our triangle of our rectangle is pi over two, and then our first height is two, and our second height is three. So here's our overall sum, five pi over two. Um, so today we're going to kind of take a step away from the Riemann sum and we're going to focus um, on the definite integral. So we will actually learn how to evaluate a definite integral, but First, we're going to learn some properties of definite integrals that we can use. Um, so remember, a definite integral helps us find the exact area under the curve. And just remember, when we say under the curve, what we really mean is between the curve and the x-axis. So here's a quick reminder of what our definite integral looks like. So this is our integral um, symbol, kind of looks like a, a stretched out s. Um, a is going to be our lower limit, um, b is our upper limit, and then remember we can think of this as the height of the function, which is just, again, the y value, and then this is the width, um, delta x. And of course, we would like that to approach uh, zero, so the rectangles are really, really, really um, narrow, and you have more rectangles. That was kind of the idea as, as the rectangles get increasingly small, the number gets increasingly large, and you end up with this definite integral. All right, so our properties of definite integrals, we can use these to help us um, simplify, and oftentimes it makes this easier for us to evaluate. Um, so this first one says if you're evaluating the integral of a function from A to B, um, it's just the opposite of the integral from B to A. So for this one, the way we apply this is usually when we're given something like this, if we see something like this, it's kind of strange to have the lower limit, what we call the lower limit, be a larger number than the upper limit. So for this, we would actually want to rewrite it like this, allowing us to evaluate that integral. So that's kind of the main application of this one, and it is really useful. This next uh, property says that if, you're, if you have a definite integral of a function from a to a, that is always going to equal zero. So the logic behind that, here's my function and here's just a. If you're trying to think of this in terms of rectangles, we have a height of our function, but here the width of our rectangle 
is zero. So if you have, even if you have a height um, with times height, it would still equal zero. So that's the reason why this definite integral is equal to zero. Um, for this next one, we have the um, definite integral from a to b of c dx, so it's just a constant function. And it's just going to be c times b minus a. So um, here, remember, if you just have y equals c as your function, it just looks like this. And if you're working from a to b, well, think of it again as a triangle, as a rectangle. Um, the width of our rectangle is going to be b minus a. That's just our width. And the height of our rectangle is c because it is constant and it just makes a single rectangle. So that's why this property works. Um, these next three properties look really similar to some of our properties um, of limits and derivatives. So this should look very familiar. If you're taking um, the integral from a to b of c, f of x, where c is a constant, you can pull the constant out front, take that integral, and then multiply by the constant after. Oftentimes makes it a little easier to do. If you're taking the definite integral of the sum or difference of two functions, you can find those individual integrals and take the sum or difference of those. Um, and then last, if you're finding an integral uh, from a to b of some function, so let's say like here's my function, and here's a to b, and then you're um, adding the integral from b to c, um, so this area, you're really just adding up um, or you're finding the total um, area under the curve from a to c. So you can just say it's the integral from a to c. So if these match, then you can just say it's from a to c because it really is just a continuous area under your curve. Um, so again, these are our properties of definite integrals. There are more properties of definite integrals that you can find in your textbook, but these are the most important ones and the ones that we use the most. All right, so let's give one a try together. So here we're given that the integral from one to four of f of x dx is 10, and the integral from three to four of f of x dx is negative three. And we're gonna try to evaluate these integrals um, using the properties that we just learned. So first we wanna find um, the value of the integral from one to three of f of x dx. So remember, um, we can kind of piece it together. We know that the integral from one to three um, plus 3 to 4 should equal 1 to 4, right? And we know that from um, 1 to 4 that it's equal to 10, and we know that from 3 to 4 our um, integral is equal to negative 3. So again, we know that the integral from 1 to 3 f of x dx plus the integral from 3 to 4 of f of x dx is equal to the integral from one to four of f of x dx. So let's substitute what we know. Again, this is what we're trying to find. So the integral of one to three f of x dx um, plus negative three, um, that's the value of this integral, equals 10. That's the value of the integral from one to four. And then uh, we could just do some basic algebra, algebra, add three to both sides, and we see that the integral from one to three of f of x dx equals 13. So this is probably something you could have worked out in your head just kind of using logic, but it is good to write it out using our properties so we can really apply what we are learning. All right, and then for the last one, notice here we have the integral from 4 to 3 of 7 times f of x. So first, you'll notice that our lower boundary is actually higher than our upper boundary, so we'll want to flip that by putting a negative out front. And let's pull our constant out front as well. Um, so then the integral from 3 to 4, f of x dx. Um, and then this is a given value for us. We know that this value is equal to negative 3. So we have negative 7 times negative 3. So this is equal to positive 21. There you have it. All right, let's try another one together. So here we're given that the integral from 1 to 3 of e to the x dx is equal to e cubed minus e. So I'd like us to evaluate the integral from 1 to 3 of e to the x minus 1. So we can use one of our properties, and we can, um, since it's the difference of, uh, the integral of the difference of two individual functions, we can rewrite it like this. Um, of negative 1. Um, so here we have um, a value that we know. We know that this integral is equal to e cubed minus e. 
And then here we have a constant function. So we can use um, our constant function. So we know that the height here um, is negative one. It's at a constant height of negative one. And then we do times b minus a times three minus one. So remember with the constant function, just think of it as a single rectangle. Here's the height of our rectangle. Here's the width of our rectangle. And now we just simplify, so we have e cubed minus e plus 2. So now we're going to start talking about how to actually evaluate um, a definite integral um, by hand. Um, so that will lead us to what's called the fundamental theorem of calculus. And we really need to kind of work our way through this one step at a time. So we're going to do a little example that I think will help us understand um, that fundamental theorem of calculus. So first, let's take this definite integral, the integral from 0 to x of 3t dt. And let's see if we can um, describe this integral using areas. And remember, uh, and so here, since x is our upper boundary, and x can vary, right, x can be anything, just think of this as the um, area on the curve of so far. So just kind of pick an arbitrary spot when you're drawing uh, your picture. So um, if you kind of sketch out what this function looks like, this is just a linear function with a slope of 3. Um, so it looks like this roughly speaking, and the um, y-intercept is at zero. So let's say that, okay, this is x. So from zero to x. So we want to find um, this area um, just using our area of a triangle formula. Um, so the base of our triangle is just x, and the height of our triangle is just going to be 3x. So if we're finding the area of that triangle, one-half base times height, so the area is 3x squared over 2. Um, so we can make this statement that the integral from 0 to x of 3t dt equals 3x squared over 2, and I'm going to just define that, you'll see why in a little bit, as g of x. All right, so now I want us to compare f of x with the solution that we just got for the area under that curve. So we see, we know that f of x was just 3x, that's the curve we are working with, and we see that the area under that curve, g of x equals 3x squared over 2. So if you actually compare these two things, you might notice, if you're looking really carefully, that g of x is actually the antiderivative of 3x, right? If I take the derivative of g of x, I get f of x. So g of x is an antiderivative of f of x, which means that um, we can make the statement that g prime of x equals f of x, as we just said. So if, if something is an antiderivative of something else, if you take the derivative, it equals that other function. So that means, again, that generally speaking, we can see that we're defining g of x as um, the um, integral from 0 to x. And I'll just make a general statement about any function, f of x, um, or f of t, sorry, dt. Um, so that's how we're defining g of x. Again, that's what we found up here, but then I'm generalizing it with f of t instead of 3t. So that means that if I'm just um, describing g prime of x, it's simply the derivative of this integral, and we could write it like this, d dx of 0 to x f of t dt. And we know above that g prime of x is equal to f of x, and this is also equal to g prime of x, so we can say that this derivative is simply equal to f of x. So it's essentially saying the derivative of our definite integral is just equal to the function, our definite integral from 0 to x. So when you look at that, you can almost think of it like they're undoing each other. So remember, we talked about earlier this year that a derivative and an integral are kind of like inverse operations. They kind of undo each other because it's kind of going backwards and forwards. All right, so what if we wanted to find this definite integral without graphing and without 
um, using a different area formula? Or what if it wasn't even possible for us to do this? Um, how do we uh, define a definite integral that's going to be using uh, that fundamental theorem of calculus? So let's see if we can kind of work our way there to help us really understand where this theorem is coming from. So we're defining, we're saying g of x equals this definite integral. And from above, we, we saw that we can say that g prime of x equals f of x. So remember when we took the derivative of this, it kind of canceled out and it gave us that original function. Um, so by definition, if g prime of x equals f of x, that means again that g prime of or that g of x is an antiderivative. So from here I can make the statement that um, g of x equals capital F of x plus c. So remember this is kind of that general um, antiderivative form. So it's just another way of saying g of x is the antiderivative um, of f of x. So here I'm going to substitute what g of x is equal to from right here. So I'm going to say from a to x, f of t dt equals f of x plus c. And then I'm going to um, consider two things. I'm going to say, well, okay, what if x is equal to a? Um, and then I'm going to say, well, what if x is equal to b? So if x is equal to a, let's substitute that. So I'm going to do this in, let's do this in red. So if x equals a, we're taking the um, integral from a to a of f of t, d of t. And that means f of a plus c. Well, we know from our properties that the definite integral from a to a is just zero. So we could say zero equals f of a plus c. Um, so this actually allows us to solve for c, that constant of integration. We can see that c is equal to negative f of a. So we're going to come back to that in just a moment. And now I'm going to substitute x with b. So if x is equal to b, we have the integral from a to b of f of t dt equals f of b plus c. So I went back and I substituted that back into this. And then we have one final step that's going to be substituting our c value here for right here. So when we do that, we have an integral from a to b of f of t dt equals um, f of b, and then it's actually going to be minus f of a. So this, if you look at it, is just a general form of the definite integral from a to b of some function. Um, so this is the fundamental theorem of calculus, and actually this is part two. Um, we're going to cover part two of, and then we'll come back to part one um, by the end of this lesson. But again, this is how we can evaluate a definite integral um, algebraically. So you take, you find the antiderivative of your function and then you evaluate it at b and then you subtract um, that antiderivative evaluated at a. And again, that is our fundamental theorem of calculus part two, allowing us to um, evaluate a definite integral. All right, so here's that fundamental theorem of calculus. Again, this is part two, just um, a little bit more um, cleaned up. So first, um, the function must be continuous over the interval a to b. That is really important. But the integral from a to b of f of x dx is just the antiderivative of f um, evaluated from b to a, and you subtract those two values. So f of b minus f of a. That's all it is. That's how we will evaluate our definite integrals. All right, so let's give one of these a try together. So here we have the integral from 0 to 4 of 16 minus x squared dx. So let's start by finding our antiderivative, capital F of x. So um, for the 16, we know that antiderivative will be 16x. And then for our next term, we know it will be uh, minus 1 third x cubed and then plus c. We do have that constant of integration technically, but you're going to see that something is going to happen with these types of problems. Um, so we're going to evaluate it at 4 and then at 0, and we're going to subtract from there. Um, so let's find f of 4 
Um, so we have 16 times 4 minus 1 third times 4 cubed plus C. Um, so that's going to be 64 minus um, 64 thirds um, plus C. All right, and then we could evaluate our antiderivative at um, 0. Um, so 16 times 0 minus 1 third times 0 cubed plus C, so f of 0 is just going to equal C. Um, and then if we do f of 4 minus f of 0, we get 64 minus 64 thirds plus C, and then minus C. Um, so you can see that our C's are going to cancel out here, like this, um, and then we just need to combine our fractions. So we can see that f of 4 minus f of 0 um, is 128 thirds. So that will be the exact value of our definite integral of 16 minus x squared dx. Um, so when we're doing this process, you can see that um, when we have that constant of integration, since we're going to be subtracting f of a from f of b, those c values are always going to cancel out. So although technically they should be there in our general antiderivative, from here on out, you don't need um, to include c for your um, when you're doing a definite integral over a given in, um, interval. Okay, so for the rest of the examples, I'm going to exclude C because they are always going to cancel out when we are evaluating these types of definite integrals. All right, let's try another one together. So we, here we have the integral from 0 to pi of sine of x dx. So just slightly different um, notation. Um, we can just go straight to our antiderivative. Um, so if we're uh, ending with sine of x, we would have negative cosine of x. Um, and again, we don't need that constant of integration for these types of problems. And then we'll just say from 0 to pi. Um, so then that means that we're going to do negative cosine of pi minus negative cosine of 0. So remember, we're doing f of b minus f of a. Um, so we have negative, and the cosine of pi is negative 1, minus negative, and the cosine of 0 is 1. So here we have 1 plus 1, which is 2. So that's just kind of a different way of um, expressing um, that process of evaluating the definite integral. Okay, uh, let's try this next example together. So here we have the integral from 1 to 4 of square root of x minus 1 over x squared um, dx. Um, so let's take our um, antiderivative. So here, remember, this is x to the 1 half. So that means that we would have to have x to the 3 halves because according to the power rule, it decreases by 1. But you'll notice that the coefficient of this is 1. So if this were multiplied out front and we end up with 1, that coefficient should be 2 thirds. Um, and then here, just remember that this is um, x to the power of negative 2. Um, so then 1 above that would be x to the power of negative 1. And since this is being multiplied out front, we just say plus. Um, and we're going to evaluate that from 1 to 4. All right, so let's start by um, substituting 4. Um, so we have 2 thirds. And then here we know 4. Um, well, we could do the square root of 4 is 2, and 2 cubed is 8. So 2 thirds times 8 plus 1 fourth. And then minus, um, here we would have 2 thirds times 1. So just 2 thirds. Um, and then plus one. Um, and then from here, let's keep simplifying. We have 16 thirds plus one fourth, and then we have minus uh, five thirds. So that leaves us with 11 thirds plus one fourth. Um, so we have 44 twelfths plus three twelfths. So 47 twelfths. All right, so now um, that we've been using the fundamental theorem of calculus part two, we're gonna kind of circle back and work with part one. So this says that um, f is continuous over the interval a to b, and then we have this function g, um, which is defined as the integral from a to x of f of t dt. 
Um, then the fundamental theorem of calculus part one tells us that g of x is also continuous on that interval and differentiable over that interval. And here's kind of the important part, g prime of t equals f of x. So it's essentially saying that um, taking the derivative of this kind of undoes the integral because remember um, derivatives and integrals are almost um, they're almost like inverse operations of each other. They kind of go back and forth. So um, taking the derivative of an integral just essentially cancels out and you're left with just this function. So in other words, if you take the derivative of an interval over the um, between a and x, um, you're, it would just simplify to simply f of x. Now, if you're taking the derivative of an integral over um, the interval a to g of x, so if your upper boundary um, is a function in itself, then um, this derivative would be equal to f of g of x. So you're actually going to plug this function into your function, and then you multiply it by um, the derivative of g of x. And we'll kind of talk about why that works as well. Um, but uh, for part two, again, we really kind of focus on um, taking the derivative of a function that is represented by an integral. All right, let's try a couple of these together. Um, so here we're finding dy dx if y is defined by um, some integral. Um, so for this first one, before we kind of use, I'll call it like a shortcut, which is FTC part one, um, I wanna show you kind of why this works. So again, if we're doing dy dx, we're taking the derivative of this integral. I'm gonna write it again here. Okay, so now let's imagine that we were using um, the fundamental theorem of calculus um, part two to evaluate this integral. Um, so we would still have d dx, and let's say that I'm just gonna define, we, we could find this antiderivative, but let's just say we call it f of t. Um, so f of t, and then evaluated from one to x. So imagine we're again using part two. We have d dx, of f of x minus f of one. And I wanna remind you that f of one would be a constant. So when we go to take the derivative of each of these two um, individual functions, this would become zero because the derivative of any constant is zero. Um, so that really just leaves us with d dx of f of x. And remember, this represents the antiderivative of our function. So we took the antiderivative, and then we're taking the derivative of that. So that just leaves us with f of x, um, which is t squared minus 1 to the power of 20. So that would be our answer. Um, but we don't need to show all of this each time. We can kind of use um, our shortcut, which is the fundamental theorem of calculus, part one. So essentially, anytime you see that you're taking the derivative of an integral um, where your upper boundary is x, we're essentially just going to take this upper boundary and substitute it for t here and right here. Um, so when I do that, I'm left with x squared minus 1 to the power of 20 dx. Um, and we know that if we're taking the derivative of just um, the function x, that that is just equal to 1. So our final answer would just be x squared minus 1 to the power of 20. Um, so now that we kind of understand why um, this um, part 1 works, you can kind of skip all of this and just go straight to this process. Um, all right, so let's try this next one. So here you'll notice that our upper boundary is no longer just x. It's x squared, so we have to do a little bit of extra work, but it's nothing too complicated. So we're going to take this upper boundary. Remember, since we're taking the derivative of an integral, um, we can use FTC part one, and we're gonna put this here and here. So it becomes the sine of x squared times dx squared. So that's the sine of x squared times the derivative of x squared, um, which is 2x, and then we'll just write our final answer as 2x sine of x squared. So remember, you don't need to show all of this extra work that we did in this first part here. We can just use our fundamental theorem of calculus, part one. So just remember that 
um, you are replacing your upper boundary here and here. So sometimes you do need to take the derivative of whatever this function is. All right, let's try a couple more together. Um, so again, we'll use up um, FTC part one. So I'm gonna take all of this and I'm gonna plug it in right here and right here. Um, so it becomes e to the power of one minus three x times the derivative of one minus three x. And we know that this derivative is just negative three. Um, so we know that y prime is negative three e to the power of one minus three x. So once you know how to use that FTC part one, these can be pretty um, quick and easy problems. Now let's look at part B. Um, so if you'll notice that our uh, fundamental theorem of calculus part one said is the integral from some constant to x. So here our x um, is on the bottom and this constant is on the top. So we know that we can actually flip that by making our integral negative. So we're gonna wanna do that first. Um, before we can use FTC part one. So we're gonna put a negative out front and that allows us to flip the negative seven to the bottom and the three X squared to the top. So from here, now I can use the fundamental theorem of calculus and I'm gonna replace the T with the three X um, squared. The negative is still going to stay there, but then we have three X squared squared times the derivative of three X squared. Um, so we know this gives us negative 9x to the 4th times um, 6x. So that means that y prime equals negative 54x to the 5th. And there you have it. All right, let's try one more example together. Um, so here uh, we have a function g of x, which is um, represented by the integral from zero to x of f of t, and this is the graph of f of t below. So here we're going to estimate the following um, values, which again is essentially just the area under the curve from zero to whatever our x value is. So if we're starting out with um, g of zero, that means the integral from zero to zero of f of t dt, and we know that if these two um, values are the same, then that area is equal to zero. Because remember, essentially we have, if you were thinking of like the rectangle method, this rectangle has no width, so it doesn't exist, so it's equal to zero. Uh, now let's do g of one. So the area under the curve from zero to one. So we can look at our triangle over here. Um, well, the area under the curve from zero to one is a triangle. Um, so we can actually just do one half times base times height. So one half times one times two is equal to one. And I'm just gonna put a little one in here because that's the area of that region. Um, so if we wanna find G of two, well, it's just gonna be the previous area plus, so it's gonna be one plus um, the integral from one to two. So we just need to find this next area from here to here, which is two, we're gonna add them up. So one plus two is equal to three. Um, then if we wanna find g of three, well, it's um, going to be the area from zero to two plus the area from two to three. So that's the new part that we have to find. Um, so for this part, I don't know, we can kind of estimate what this area is. Um, it's definitely going to be a little more than one. I don't know, let's call it like 1.2. Again, this is just kind of an estimate. Um, so 3 plus 1.2. So now we're at 4.2. Now for this next portion, you'll notice that um, the region from 3 to 4 is underneath um, the x-axis, which means that this area, we consider that a negative value. Um, so it does actually look like this is kind of like a symmetrical area. Um, so when I would estimate the area of this, so from here to here, I'm going to say it's negative 1.2. It kind of feels like it cancels out. It's like about the same. Again, it's an estimate, but I think that we could probably say that those two areas are just opposites. So that means that it's the total area so far plus this extra area, so plus the area from three to four, which we're estimating is about negative 1.2, so 
minus 1.2, so that brings us back to 3. And if we want g of 5, well, it's going to be the area so far, which is 3 plus that last little area um, from 4 to 5, f of t dt. So again, we're going to kind of estimate, but this does look like um, it's symmetrical over this line. So if this is negative 1.2, I'm going to also say that this is negative 1.2. Um, so that leaves us with 3 minus 1.2. So we have 1.8. So there you go. Um, so just remember that anything underneath the x-axis, the area between the curve and the x-axis is going to be a negative value. Anything above is going to be a positive value. Um, then we're also going to look at what, where is um, g of x increasing and decreasing. So we could see that g of x um, is decreasing pretty much whenever f of t is above because anything above gives us a positive area. So g of x is increasing from 0 to 3. And then once it starts dipping below, then our area, which is g of x, is going to start decreasing. Um, so g of x is decreasing from 3 to 5. And then if we are looking for our local extrema, we're going to think way back to um, first semester. And we know that um, g of x will have a local max when it's derivative g prime of x, which is just f of x, because remember, if you take the derivative of an integral, it just is the original function. We know that um, a maximum occurs when your derivative changes from increasing to decreasing, or sorry, from positive to negative, from positive to negative, which means that your function is changing from increasing to decreasing. So we could see that f of um, x changes from positive to negative at x equals 3. And then we know that a local min, um, g of x will have a local min when its derivative, again, which is just f of x, changes from negative to positive. And we can see that that's never actually happening for this graph. It is, um, It does hit 0 again, but it's not actually crossing over. So in this case, we would say that there's no local min. So that's definitely bringing in stuff from first semester. Um, so we still have to remember what the first derivative tells us, what the second derivative tells us, and of course, it all ties together. All right, um, so that is all for today's video. Thank you so much for watching.